subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Thank you very much, uh, Vikram, and thank you, Ajay, for organizing this meeting and inviting me uh, to this uh, monthly meeting. And thank you, Subha, for agreeing to participate. It's always nice to be in a meeting where you're, uh, you're discussing with a former colleague. Uh, I mean, it has the disadvantage that he knows all about uh, everything that went on. Uh, but I mean, uh, he's giving you a first-hand uh, perspective from his uh, point of view. It's really nice to share a stage with you again, Subha. You know, uh, I've been asked to speak for 10 minutes or 12 minutes. And I, I was reluctant to do that because I felt having written a book of a few hundred pages, I should really let Subha Rao uh, tear it apart. And that would be much more interesting for the audience. But everybody said that I think I should say something. They thought I should say something. So here I am. You know, one thing I want to make clear is that this book is not, and I say that right at the beginning, this book is not a memoir. You know, a memoir is uh, you telling your story. Uh, in fact, I say in the book that I got put off the idea of writing a memoir because I read somewhere in the New York Times that memoirs are selfies in book form. And I thought that was a nice way of describing a memoir. This is really an inside story of how reforms happen. So it's not just my story, although I was privileged to be a part of it and have a ringside seat. And I'm not just giving my view because the great advantage of a memoir is that you just say, well, look, this is what I saw and I'm not trying to triangulate. That's for you to do. Now, this is not a scholarly book because I'm not really taking everything and subjecting it to very detailed statistical analysis. But I'm telling a story of how I thought the economic reform process uh, unbound. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can question uh, each of those things. But some of what I'm saying relates to not necessarily what I participated in myself, but what I know was happening uh, at that time. So this is one point. Now, the second point is that, you know, I think uh, this book deals uh, with a problem which my generation of economists, and uh, that would include almost everybody from the age of uh, maybe 65 to 80, uh, would be familiar with. In the 1980s, you know, we India had a very slow growth through the 1970s. In fact, in the book, what I, I do say that up to the mid 60s, India was actually not doing badly. That those were the Nehruvian years. Uh, India was not growing as fast as we wanted to, but there weren't too many other developing countries that were growing rapidly. What happened after the mid 60s through the 70s was that India's growth rate went down, whereas everybody else's growth rate went up. And so, I mean, Raj Krishna called this the sort of Hindu growth rate. At that time, this was not a very sensitive issue, and everybody thought that was a good joke that he had made. Uh, and it just became a description of India simply not, not growing rapidly. Okay, And my generation was really very concerned about that. I mean, we knew what was going on in the rest of the world. We felt that India should be doing a lot better than it's doing. And at least in my case, I was convinced that uh, the problems, the reasons we were not doing well were that our policies were all wrong. I mean, this is the old control economy, uh, everything being restricted, suspicion of the private sector, uh, too much reliance on the public sector, almost as a matter of ideology, and a closed economy not allowing much trade or encouraging it, et cetera, et cetera. And this needed to change. And I think I joined the government of India in 1979, came back from the World Bank. And, you know, at that time, uh, the problems were not that well known, but there was a lot of discussion internally. And I remember that internally, senior officials, uh, we, we as middle level officials were exposed to discussion with senior officials. Many of the senior officials sort of reflected the fact that, you know, we're not doing the right thing. It's not that we were the only people pushing for change. 
even those guys but you know when you're secretary and you're doing it you create an atmosphere where you're willing to listen but you can't actually be implementing the changes yourself so it was a very fascinating period and in the 1980s thinking began to change but the change was very incremental in fact i had the privilege of uh, being dragged into or inducted into rajiv gandhi's office when he was prime minister and you know when he began he talked about uh, taking india into the 21st century in parliament he said that we cannot be as good as other countries if we are working with systems that are 10 years out of date so this was the first time that a prime minister was saying that look our systems are all wrong and lots of people thought that huge reforms are about to happen but of course they didn't happen i mean some things did happen there was a beginning of change but it was only in 1991 uh, that real change took place that was under the prime ministership of prime minister narasimha rao uh, with manmohan singh as his finance minister and i think that uh, politicians political scientists and so on will spend a lot of time wondering about what is it that caused that change to happen you know, from my perspective i mean i know that prime minister narasimha rao was actually quite open to change you know he was not he was a very pragmatic person he was not locked into an ideology he wasn't designing the reform that was all left to manmohan singh that's why he had brought him in as finance minister but you know these reforms would not have taken place if the prime minister had not backed the finance minister and it's totally clear that you know within the congress party there was very little support for these ideas and it was left to dr manmohan singh to explain to the rest of the rest of the country why we have to do these things in fact i mentioned in the book that um, manmohan ji had in fact mentioned to me that prime minister rao had been uh, quite frank with him because manmohan singh had said that look you want me to be prime minister finance minister but you know uh, i have to be sure that you will back the changes that i do uh, which i think are necessary and uh, uh, prime minister rao said look you go ahead and do what you think is necessary uh, and you know if it works we'll share the credit and if it doesn't work you will get blamed and i think that's a totally fair that's a totally fair uh, breaking down of responsibility between the person who's supposed to get the reforms done in practice and the person who's providing the political backing uh, for those reforms so that's one part of the story i think there's no doubt that those reforms you know there was a lot of criticism at the time that these reforms are being pushed on us by the imf because we had a balance of payments crisis and but for that we wouldn't have done the reforms in my book i say that's completely wrong there was a very substantial internal kind of getting to grips with the problem with people with different perspectives contributing to it and we all knew that we had to change though maybe different people thought the urgency of change was different and there's no question that you know we would not have been able we wanted the imf assistance in fact the government before narsim rao the chandrashekhar government had started negotiating with the imf and the imf would not have lent money without reasonable conditionality and that would have related to reducing the fiscal deficit maybe the devaluation a few little bits of liberalization here or there but you know what we actually did was well beyond what the imf hoped to get so uh, the idea that the reforms were thrust down the indian government's throat because of the imf uh, this idea is completely wrong now one issue then comes up is that you know how much did we achieve and here i want to emphasize that uh, one aspect of the reforms of the 1980s was that it was not a big bang reform although in certain areas it was but it was very it was very much a gradualist approach that is you indicate a broad direction you reassure people that look you're not rushing off and making huge changes Uh, and you slowly start making changes i mean one of the good examples of that uh, is that um, in the whole business of opening up the economy uh, to uh, external trade and 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 foreign investment and foreign technology uh, we we took the view that customs duties have to be reduced 
but they'll be reduced gradually. And gradually meant bring them down to the levels prevailing in the ASEAN countries. And that was to be done over several years. And, you know, one consequence of that was that we were able to build a certain consensus uh, in favor of change. Another consequence was that the benefits of the change were delayed. So, I mean, you have to balance this off. I mean, if you can't do it all together, the benefits will be delayed. Uh, but on the other hand, you will build a consensus. Now, I don't think there's any doubt that the Narsim Rao and Mohan Singh strategy of the 1990s did succeed in building a broader consensus. Now, partly this was helped by the collapse of the Soviet Union, because the left, which was uh, very suspicious of all this, kind of slightly lost wind in their sails when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, but anyway, uh, across the spectrum, uh, the government that succeeded the Narsim Rao government, that is the United Front, then the NDA government under Prime Minister Vajpayee actually continued in this reform sequence. So I think that continuity uh, sort of gave the impression of continuity with change, which, you know, internationally also uh, was sort of appreciated. Because if you have a very large country uh, and it it, it gives the impression that it might go through convulsions, that creates a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so I think on the whole, uh, the impact was delayed, uh, but it was there. And in the year from 2003, four onwards, you see that in the growth rate increase. You know, some people have uh, rubbished the growth rate increase after 2004 on the grounds that that's just the global economy. Uh, uh, booming. It's true that those were boom years. But you know, the increase in India's growth rate was much greater than the mere increase in the global economy. Because, you know, we had a growth rate of three and a half percent up to the 70s. Then in the 80s, it went up to about five and a half. That was the result of uh, marginal liberalization. And in the 2000s, the average growth, I mean, the average growth rate during the UPA period which includes a slowing down in the last three years, was 7.7%. So a clearly uh, a significant acceleration. And around about 2010, uh, people were even talking that, you know, uh, China is now going to slow down uh, inevitably, uh, but India is actually picking up. And maybe India might even become the fastest growing economy uh, of all. So that was, I think, a vindication of the underlying strategy of economic reform. Now, I want to stop at this point, but I just want to mention that in my book, and I should, by the way, uh, uh, respond to the temptation to show you the book. And this is the book that I'm talking about. I mean, I hope that some of you will get a chance to read it. Uh, and you can, you, can, you can compare what I'm saying now with what's in the book. As a general rule, I mean, if something I'm saying today is different, from what I've said in the book, uh, then it's probably because I may have slightly changed my mind. But by and large, the law, big message in the book, I think, uh, remains. And the critical thing I talk about at the very end uh, is relevant because after the Congress, the NDA, the UPA government lost its election and the NDA government under Prime Minister Modi came in, you know, the dominant message on the economic front was that, look, uh, the economy has slowed down. We must reverse that, go back to double digit growth, all of which was quite good. And the broad thrust of reforms also seemed to be not very different uh, from what uh, 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 what existed earlier, just the belief that the new government was going to be more efficient at doing things. Uh, now, you know, there are some changes that appear to have come in, uh, particularly on the issue of uh, what is called self-reliance. It looks as if we seem to be now changing track from the old uh, strategy that we should reduce import duties to a strategy that says, no, no, we can increase import duties. And in the last three years, we have raised duties in over 100 items, which is a, quite a major reversal of the past trend. You know, for the rest, I think the broad thrust of the reforms is not that different. Although the, the argument, the, the politics has become much more polarized, and that's fair enough. 
governments uh, don't want to emphasize continuity, which they earlier did. But as long as they're doing the same thing and saying we're going to do it better, I think there's nothing wrong with that. The only area, and I would say, by the way, on some of those things, there is continuity. For example, uh, we're not hung up on the public sector being the dominant force. We weren't earlier. That, that message continues. It's a pro-private sector message, which a lot of talk about ease of doing business, which is good. Uh, there are all the usual problems of uh, reforming land laws and labor laws, and they turn out to be a lot more difficult than you might think. And, and those difficulties have prevented more from being done. The one area where I think uh, we seem to be rethinking our position, and I think that's worth discussing, is should we somehow go back to raising import duties? Were we wrong to lower import duties? I don't think we were. And I think it would be a mistake to go back to this closed economy framework. I mean, I've said publicly that um, it's very unfortunate that we seem to have decided not to join RCEP, uh, which is the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement being led by ASEAN but which includes China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and I think logically, this is the part of the global economy that's going to grow fastest. It's also the part of the global economy that seems to be at the moment, not at all interested in uh, protectionism. There's a difference with China because China is a very non-transparent economy. Well, you know, we should handle that as a separate China issue. But to say we will not join the East Asian uh, trading community because of China looks like throwing the baby out of the, with the bathwater, especially, especially since the prospects of a revival of multilateral trade liberalization do not seem to be very good. So I think that's the one area where I think we do need to think. And the other big area really is the fiscal deficit. Now, you know, the COVID pandemic has brought that out very sharply. I mean, our fiscal deficit is not through the roof. Uh, and while my personal view is that in the middle of a pandemic that is justified, uh, we will have to bring it down uh, because we cannot continue with huge fiscal deficits which don't allow enough room for private sector to expand. But of course, private sector expansion is only going to take place if the balance sheets of the private sector companies are adequately repaired, and also if the banks are in a position to lend. And there's another problem, because at the present moment, uh, there seems to be lots of uncertainty, uh, not enough equity strength in the Indian private sector, and huge problems with the banks with uncertainty, and public sector banks really being very liquid, but not lending. So those are some of the things, but uh, Suba is much more knowledgeable on these things, having been governor. And I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing his views on how he sees the situation and what are the challenges ahead. So thank you very much for letting me take up so much time and now throwing myself to the wolves. Uh, and Suba, you can have a big bite at it right at the beginning. So thank you very much, sir, for that presentation. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to be in conversation with you on your book. My association with Dr. Alivalia goes back three decades. I was a joint secretary in the Ministry of Finance when he was finance secretary. And we used to bask in reflected glory. People used to look up to us because simply because we were part of his team. Subsequently, I became finance secretary and then governor of RBI. And he was deputy chairman planning commission we worked on many things together, including managing the fallout of the global financial crisis. I really enjoyed reading this book. It's a deeply engrossing book, and it's part of commendable for many reasons. I just want to cite three reasons. The first reason I found the book commendable is because of the content. It's an impressive sweep of India's economic history for the last 40 years. Every issue, every topic, every political development has been reflected upon and in context. The second reason I found the book commendable is because of the presentation. 
in the acknowledgments, Dr. Lewalia talks about the advice is laid by Isha Gere, which is to say that remember that you're not writing an economic textbook or a white paper. And I think he stuck to that advice without compromising on substance. He tells a deeply engrossing story of economic reforms and explains every issue, what we think are dry issues in a very lucid style. For example, why is devaluation an, an imperative uh, when you're dealing with an external payments crisis or the ups and downs of the civil nuclear deal? The third reason I found the book commendable is because it is a testimonial to Dr. Aluwalia's character and personality. For a man who's had such an illustrious career, he became a division chief in the World Bank before he turned 30, and he became a secretary to the government of India before he turned 50. And for a man who's had so many accomplishments, he's been remarkably self-effacing. He tells the story of India's economic reforms, the ups and downs, the successes and the setbacks, the joys and disappointments with absolute honesty and humility. So I want to say that uh, it's a deeply engrossing book. Congratulations, sir. And thank you for joining this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I want to engage you on the political economy of reforms. Economic reforms is the theme of your book. In some sense, outside of political leadership, you've been the face of India's economic reforms. You piloted and negotiated reforms through India's complex democratic politics. And I think there's nobody who has a better understanding of the political economy of reforms than you have. I want you to bring that experience and expertise to engage on the current agitation over the farm laws. Virtually everyone has agreed that reforms in the agriculture sector are important. You yourself write about them, about the need for bringing private sector, uh, private markets into agriculture, about repealing the Essential Commodities Act, about uh, introducing contract farming. That's exactly what the NDA government has done. The only concrete criticism against the government has been that they've not discussed enough, they've not consulted enough, they've not allowed a debate in the parliament. To which the government's response has been that uh, these reforms have been in discussion in consultation for several decades over several governments. So based on your long experience in negotiating economic, reform, economic reforms, two questions. What, how do you think this impasse should be resolved? And how do you view the political economy of the standoff? Well, thank you, um, Subha. As usual, you've uh, put your finger on a very difficult uh, problem and quite rightly putting me on the spot. So I don't mind trying to address this issue. Uh, you're right in saying that uh, by and large, economists, and certainly me, and not just me, but many other people, uh, were of the view that we need to reform agricultural markets and bring in the private sector, give it a larger role. Uh, why this is, the, the big difference though, is that our interpretation at that time was that this is constitutionally something which can only be done by the state government. So economists having agreed, uh, the idea was to persuade state governments. And of course, we failed to persuade state governments because very few state governments did anything. Uh, but discussion went on. I think, as you point out, uh, the government has said that this has been discussed for so long. But the crux of the earlier discussion was that this is what makes economic sense. And please, state governments, will you do the needful? And they weren't doing it, so nobody felt aggrieved. What has happened now is that there's an interpretation under the Constitution that actually you don't have to wait for state governments. Now, I'm not a, a lawyer, so that constitutional issue 
that is, are these laws constitutionally okay? This is something that only the Supreme Court can pronounce. But even if they are okay, uh, as you yourself pointed out, there is a perception that the matter was rushed through Parliament, that there was no harm, after all, in having a discussion uh, in Parliament, uh, send the thing to a standing committee. It would have taken another three or four months, but it would have enabled different points of view uh, to surface. And maybe some of the amendments which uh, the government now seems willing to do uh, would have come up in the course of this process. So I think that uh, one, one general point that arises is that when you have reforms that are going to affect people, then discussion and participation, et cetera, is part of the process of consensus building. So this is one point. I should also mention, by the way, that some of the opposition that is being put forward seems to be disagreeing with the view that you should allow markets to play a bigger role. And uh, that's a more sophisticated point of view. I should add that, you know, globally, uh, since 2008, uh, there's a rising kind of uh, doubt about whether markets are nearly as efficient as we think. Now, there's no question that even, I mean, most economists would have agreed that financial markets cannot be treated as just being efficient uh, the way real economy markets can be treated as being efficient. But now the question is being raised that are the real economy markets also efficient? Don't they require a special role for the state? Now, a lot of concern is being expressed that the purpose of these laws is essentially to get rid of the MSP, to get rid of the Mondays, to hand over the private, uh, hand over all the, uh, the cultivators to a few oligopolists, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, that the government has said that's not their intention. But in my view, in building a consensus on the kind of change that's reasonable, I think this should have been part of the discussion so that these extreme views, uh, either the government would clarify that it has no intention of doing this, or people would know that it's not the intention, and I think that has not happened. And that is really unfortunate. Having said that, I mean, I do think that some of the positions being taken have become a little extreme. I mean, for example, uh, some people are saying that we should have an MSP for every crop uh, and that the government must guarantee that farmers get the MSP. Now, that would mean government runs a procurement operation for every crop in every district. Now, quite frankly, that is not going to be feasible. So I think you need to step back and you have to talk to people. I don't know what the latest position is. I keep reading in the newspapers that the good news is that the talking is continuing, but nobody is saying that they've come to a resolution. But, you know, sometimes when, when, you, when things become politicized, you have to go through that process. I just hope uh, that we will reach some kind of a resolution uh, and that uh, people will be persuaded that it's not the intention to get rid of uh, systems of support that have existed for a long period of time. Even if over time you have to graduate, now let me say one or two things. I mean, there can be no doubt in anybody's mind that Punjab should not be growing as much paddy as it is growing. Basmati is a different matter. But the rest of the country has an adequate comparative advantage in doing that. And when Punjab grows it, it's just depleting its water table. I mean, this has been known for the last 25 years. But, you know, there are different ways of achieving the same objective. I mean, one way of achieving the same objective is to just stop offering an MSP. The other way is that maybe you give the farmers some assistance, which would help them to diversify. So I think we need, we need, to, we need to build a consensus on what is a reasonable way of making change. And this is what the Chinese mean when they say crossing the river while feeling the stones. And this is what Mr. Narsim Rao's approach always was, that you need gradualism. He was criticized for it. We were all criticized for it, uh, that, you know, you're doing things too slowly. But sometimes you have, to, it's not a bad idea. I mean, Subha, I'm tempted to remind you of, 
which you yourself have uh, mentioned in your book, that you were criticized as being baby step subarao. That was a classic example of doing things gradually. Uh, and, and the, uh, you know, to my mind, in a big country, in a diverse country, in a politically non-homogeneous country, where differences can get magnified, you're probably better off doing things a bit gradually, even if it takes a little longer. Uh, the idea is to build a consensus. And I think, uh, I, I still think it can be done. That's why I'm hoping that the government will talk to the farmers and uh, come to a resolution on this issue. So th thank you for a very elaborate and eloquent response. The sense, the message I get is that uh, it's both a flaw in the process and less of a flaw in content. But we get the point that uh, gradualism, in spite of uh, 10 years, 50, 15 years we've been discussing is still important. But I want to take that issue to a larger context of uh, political economy of reforms. The unmistakable impression one gets from reading your book is that reforms in India have become hostage to adversarial politics. Take GSD, for example. The BJP was opposed to GSD in opposition, but when they came to government, they embraced it. Uh, private entry into insurance. BJP was opposed to it, right? You write about that in the book. Uh, while in opposition, but embraced it when they came into government. Same goes for other. The UPA, on its part, campaigned for agriculture reforms, and now in opposition is contesting those reforms. So the question to you is, have reforms in India become hostage to adversarial politics? Well, uh, that's a very good question. And I mean, I, we, we should be very clear that, you know, democracy is about is an adversarial system. I mean, democracy is not a consensual system. Uh, democracy is a there's a value in the opposition opposing and the government sort of proposing. And then out of that, something sensible comes up. But I think what we need is a system in which when the government, when the government, when the opposition gets into power, if it feels that what was being done was reasonable, it quickly changes its mind and actually does it. Now, in a sense, you mentioned examples where it worked. There are some where it hasn't worked. So I think that uh, we need we need to find some way. The political leadership needs to find some way of separating what is an opportunistic opposition uh, from simply obstructing things that are otherwise good. Now you know it's quite possible that on some of these issues, political parties genuinely disagree, and they're they're disagreeing because they believe that whatever it is that they are arguing for. Uh, is somehow uh, uh, the right thing. Let's look at foreign direct investment. It's very interesting that uh, when the reforms came out, Congress party was not very happy about liberalizing foreign direct investment. But I mean, the Rao-Singh combination managed to get, get them uh, on the right side. BJP was not very, BJP was very happy about liberalizing private investment. They didn't want too many restrictions on the Indian private sector, but they had a lot of reservations about opening up to foreign direct investment. You know, the Bombay Club and all these people had raised objections and so on. But in the end, when the BJP came to power, it didn't reverse this direction. It made one or two changes here and there, but didn't reverse this direction. In the present situation, for example, the current situation, uh, the NDA government under Prime Minister Modi has not reversed the opening up to foreign direct investment. In fact, they're constantly saying they welcome foreign direct investment. The whole make in India uh, scheme is that we welcome you to come and make in India. But there are areas where there seem to be hesitation. And those areas really still re relate to uh, trading and retail. Of course, now it's spilled over into the digital trading arrangements and the problems with all these Walmarts and Amazons and what have you. So there's always certain areas that become political 
and somehow politics has to has to reconcile itself with good economics but my view is that you know if if politics manages to reconcile itself with good economics for most of the area there's no harm in it the gst for example is a very good example as you cite yourself i mean i think if i remember the the timing it was in 2006 or so that finance minister mr chidambaram said that we're going to move towards the gst started the uh, initial process bjp was not very much in favor of it in the end opposed uh, the constitutional amendments when they were put forward but when they came in in 2014 now that's quite a quite a long uh, interregnum uh, they moved for it very quickly and put it in place what has gone wrong however is not the fact of the gst it's the mucking up of the design of the gst which surely could not have been a political uh, uh compulsion i think it's just a failure of politics to internalize uh, the expert view on what is it that makes for a good gst and virtually all gst experts say that the essence of a good gst is very few rates very few exceptions and that's a very simple system and you know simplicity is also good for the smaller guy because if you don't have a simple system the big guys can handle that quite easily because they have enough uh, support in order to file complex returns the small guy doesn't have that now why did we get that wrong is a big question and it wasn't just because of the wasn't just because of the bjp the the gst council which is a central government and state government matter somehow they were not able to get good sense generating a consensus and in the search of a consensus everybody's suggestion of how to get a consensus was accepted and as a result we had one of the most uh, cumbersome gst processes and systems that have been put in place anywhere was that because of politics i think the gst thing was simply a failure to internalize uh, good expertise in tax reform uh, and it it's still with us i mean in my view that's the most important single thing that the government can and should do in fact the government could legitimately claim that the gst is its contribution because it was done during the nda government and this is the time to set it right but it has to be at some point the resolution has to be at the political level uh and i think that's the challenge how to make good economics into good enough politics i mean that's that's really why you need political leadership uh and it's the test of good political leadership that they're able to do it i don't think it's a test that they're able to do it smoothly i don't mind if at any given time they look incompetent they're not getting anywhere but if 3 years later one can say oh well they got it done i mean one should applaud that yeah your response that uh, adversarial politics is the quintessence of democracy actually prompts another question you know some a few months ago a senior official of the niti ayog said that india has too much democracy <laughs> was perhaps venting his frustration or explaining why the reforms don't get done but your book itself has plenty of examples or why the forms get diluted or delayed because of democratic politics and you talked about them yourself just now you know you say about the uh, the second leg of uh, evaluation in 1991 or the dismantling of the licensing regime nearly did not happen because of democratic politics uh the upa government could only pass a watered down land acquisition bill because of democratic politics and the nda is not able to get it through you talk about how railway passenger fares could not be raised because of democratic politics and you talk about how water irrigation water energy we cannot have comprehensive efficient reforms because of democracy so is it true uh, would you agree that uh, Forms get diluted and delayed. We don't get the first best. We don't get the second best. And are we as a nation 
condemned to the end best because of too much of democracy. You know, I let me put it this way. I do not agree with the view that, uh, to say we have too much democracy implies that you would do something to reduce the democracy you've got. I completely disagree with that view. Uh, and we are a very diverse country uh, and we ought to recognize that virtually in any economic uh, decision making, there are huge oversimplifications. Like, I mean, most economists say that, look, uh, this is good because it will increase the GDP. But, you know, we've known for well over 100 years that distributional aspects and externalities make this a very poor uh, measure. So it may be increasing the G GDP overall, but if it's in increasing the income of some people at the expense of reducing the income of other people, I mean, that's not a particularly sustainable reform. It's a different matter how far you take it. I mean, like my view always was that, look, every group needs to be able to feel that it is improving its condition of living. It may be that some groups are getting improved more than others. Now, mind you, if the groups that are getting improved more than others are lower down, that's wonderful. But it's possible that in any society, when you liberalize, it's the more advanced fellows that initially get most of the advantage. But sooner or later, other people also begin to catch up. So I would not regard a uh, you know, rigid equality of outcomes as the test. But certainly you have to accept that you must design the reform so that there's something in it for everybody. Now, this is not a very easy thing to do. I mean, for example, supposing you have a person in the middle, middle income group who is locked into a particular uh, economic activity, which doesn't generate a very, which at the moment generates adequate income, but which in structural terms is going to become outdated. So if he stays in that position, he's really not going to have much uh, of an improvement. On the other hand, new opportunities are coming up and his son may be able to benefit from these improvements. So you can have a situation where one generation of a family which is not mobile is not able to sustain its income level but another generation gets new opportunities and does extraordinarily well. Now, in, in such a situation, you know, if there are enough people benefiting, people will support the reforms. People are not adopting a very narrow definition, but they have to be talked to. They have to understand. They have to feel that their pain is being understood. And I think we do need a very basic element of uh, what used to be called welfareism. So you put a floor uh, be below which people will not uh, slip. A combination of all this can produce a market-driven, private sector-led, healthy economy. Now, my, my personal view is that we don't have the capacity in government to have a successful public sector-led development. I'm sharing a very, I'm expressing a bias which people could criticize me for. But if somebody were to say that, look, we can have a much more egalitarian society if all decisions on distribution were taken by the state, that's true in principle. But if you think that the capacity of the government to deliver a centrally directed, state-directed development is very poor, then I don't think it's worth going down that route. And my suspicion is that we are in that position. On the other hand, we are not in a position where we can simply say that what the government should do is get out of the way and the market will do the rest. And frankly, nobody does that, even in the West. The government has not got out of the way. If you look at government expenditure, the percent of GDP is much higher in Europe than it is in this country. So the idea that government must get out of the way is a naive and incorrect uh, description. But, you know, dysfunctional interventions by the government, I think there are too many of them. So, you know, in that sense, I, I was in favor of the slogan, uh, minimum government, maximum governance. That was one of the slogans put forward by the NDA when it first came in. And I think that resonated well 
But that's not what we are seeing. What we are seeing is, and this is around the world. I mean, the post-2008 and in a way the post-pandemic problems have resurrected the notion that the government has to solve everything. It is true, in my view, in the middle of the crisis, that the government has to take a much bigger role. But it would be a big mistake to think that this much bigger role must continue. I mean, when you've had a 15% drop in GDP in the first half of the year, it's absurd to think that we should maintain the fiscal deficit target because if the revenues have collapsed, then maintaining a fiscal deficit target means collapsing expenditures. That would be absurd. Therefore, we're going to have a big increase in the fiscal deficit this year. But to make that into a virtue and to say, well, we're going to continue with this level of increase in the fiscal deficit for the next several years would be quite wrong. So I think you have to, the problem really is that economics is a bit too complicated to be able to explain it to everybody, certainly not by economists. That's the brilliance of a political leader who can simplify things and sort of somehow package what is good economics, but in a way that makes people understand that, yes, they also believe that this is the right thing to do. And many times that has, I mean, after all, during the 1991 reforms, I mean, we got rid of industrial licensing. Innumerable people thought that we were leaving the economy subject to the vagaries of the market. We opened up to world markets. Exports did very well. In fact, it was during the reforms that the share of exports in GDP increased and our share of exports in global trade also increased. So we were able to do these things. Now we have to go, I mean, political scientists have to tell us uh, why was that possible and what was the role that uh, leaders played. I do think that, you know, greater debate listening to the other side's point of view persuading people is very important you know i i had to, you mentioned that i sort of a little bit became the face of these reforms in many fora and that was a great privilege and you did that too on many occasions i'm sure uh, a little later but you know when I, I was lecturing in indian universities i remember lecturing uh, and and i would talk to the faculty before giving the lecture and i would frankly ask them well, what do you think about these reforms are they good for the economy and you know the amongst the economics faculty the ratio was 70 30 against the reforms and at the middle of the lecture i would then ask for a vote amongst the students and you know they were 80 20 in favor of the reforms so i think somehow we have we have to find a process in which people hear each other uh, listen to experts, and not all experts, by the way, are particularly good. I mean, as you know very well, I mean, Keynes' very famous comment uh, about practical men who think they are completely exempt from intellectual, if I'm remembering, uh, intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Uh, and Keynes therefore had, had in mind the concept of economists versus defunct economists. It's not enough to say, are you listening to economists? The question is, are you listening to defunct economists? So even economists recognize the economists differ with each other. And if you look at the history of thinking in the West, I mean, the whole, the Keynesian revolution, the Friedman revolution, the rise of, I mean, central bankers became the masters of the universe for several years. And then after 2008, the poor fellows have not yet recovered their self-esteem. So I think there are swings. And, you know, to treat any of this stuff as gospel truth is wrong. Uh, we need more discussion. We need more participation. And I think that's what, that's what will make a difference. You know, this is doubly true in a highly diverse country like India. I mean, remember, we have states which have a per capita income five times that of the poorest state. Now, you know, that is a huge range of variation. And in my, I do mention in the book, one of the things I found most puzzling in the Planning Commission was that, you know, we never actually appreciated the fact that the development strategy in a particular state uh, would have to be very different from that in another state. 
And Meghna Desai, who has written his book very recently come out, he makes the same point. That you know, at, at one point he said that look, the states should have different strategies because they have different economic circumstances. And he was thoroughly criticized by people who felt it was anti-national. I mean, every state should follow whatever is a national strategy. I mean, I think the national strategy should be one which allows every state to build according to its comparative advantage. And it would lead to a general rise of prosperity and learning from each other and so on, rather than a top down system. And that's very important. Yeah, what you're saying is that we are not having too much democracy, but we are having less than perfect democracy. democracy. Yes, absolutely correct. Uh, we're not having a functional democracy. We're just shouting at each other. Yeah. But let me, talk it. let me change tack and ask you about uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. He's the hero of your life, hero of your book. Quite rightly, you have admiration for his knowledge, wisdom, uh, his lifestyle, austere lifestyle, his uh, self-effacing personality. You also say that he is the real architect of reforms in India. You do, of course, acknowledge, as you said just now in this conversation, that Prime Minister Narasimha Rao gave full backing to Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, gave him a virtual free pass to do whatever he wanted and gave him the political backing. But you also say that Prime Minister Rao um, was not interested in being seen as the architect of reforms. He did not lead from the front. And that uh, he was quite happy to let Dr. Manmohan Singh do the political mobilization for reforms. And Dr. Manmohan Singh was quite happy to promote reforms, to canvas support for reforms with the energy and enthusiasm. But the puzzle is this that Dr. Manmohan Singh, who canvassed reforms, who piloted reforms with so much vigor, uh, was quite passive as prime minister. Uh, you know, like you say in the book that when there was opposition to raising the prices of fertilizers, Dr. Manmohan Singh took it upon himself as the finance minister to go to the Congress parliamentary party and canvass support. But he did not show such combat respect as prime minister. Similarly, as finance minister, he was willing to use his political capital. He even resigned once, which is not accepted. But as prime minister, he did not show, he was not willing to up the stakes. So what do you think was the reason? Is it just coalition pressures that you imply? Or is there something else operating? Well, this is actually one of the most uh interesting questions and so the first thing i want to say is that uh i hope there'll be more thinking on this and don't take my word mine is not uh, the assessment of a scholar it's a gut feel assessment of a fellow hanging around the sides and maybe in a privileged position much more than that yeah. but uh, but also bias because i during the reforms the face that i saw was manmohan singh and you know, I use the word architect in a very technical sense. I mean, if you think of, people say that, the, that Shah Jahan built the Taj Mahal. Now he didn't, he wasn't the architect. There was somebody else who did the detailed designing. He just said, get it done. And it got done. So if somebody told me, does Narsimha Rao deserve to be acknowledged uh, as having contributed to India's economic history uh, uh, through the reforms, I would say clearly he does. In fact, he was very aware of the fact that, you know, he didn't want to take credit. And that's very clear from a story that I report in the book when one journalist went up to Mr. Narsim Rao and said, you know, Narsim Rao ji, how come you have turned 180 degrees? And Narsim Rao said, I haven't turned 180 degrees. The world has turned under me. Now, that was a very clever remark, but it was also a remark that did not want to present himself as a leader. And I think uh, this is why the reforms got associated with Manmohan Singh. And 
I mean, Swaminathan Iyer uh, uh, even coined the word manmonomics, uh, sort of because Mr. Rao, for whatever political reason, didn't want to be seen to be the leader. Now, you know, you need a little bit of sophisticated political analysis that was he right? Uh, was he better able to protect Manmohan Singh uh, by not becoming the leader? Because if he became the leader, then within the Congress party, many of his political colleagues would be undermining him. Whereas this way, they had to undermine Manmohan Singh. And he was, I mean, he had worked in the under Congress governments for years. He was not some Johnny come lately. I mean, he was, uh, it was well known that Mrs. Gandhi had a very high opinion of Manmohan Singh as chief economic advisor. So it was easier for him to, to take the lead. But you know, at a, at a book release uh, ceremony, I think it was Arjun Sen Gupta's book. And Mr. Narasimha Rao, who had then not in office, uh, was asked to uh, release the book. And some journalist asked him, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Ex-Prime Minister, uh, what is your view of the relationship between the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister? And Mr. Narasimha Rao made a very interesting point. I mean, he said, look, you know, the way I look at it is, the finance minister by himself is a zero. But if the prime minister is with him, then you put a one before the zero and he becomes a 10. It's a very nice poetic way of making the point. And it's, which is a point, by the way, which Manmohan Singh is very often referred to, that he got full backing. And without that backing, he would have been able to do nothing. And that's absolutely true. I don't know to what extent uh, Mr. Narasimha Rao fully understood the need for reforms in multiple dimensions. I mean, I think when the crisis was there, he realized that, listen, we can't just fool around. And the previous two governments, both the Chandrasekhar government and the VP Singh government had neglected the crisis. So I think he was very aware that this is the time to take some firm action. I think he was very aware on industry that we needed to change the industrial regime because he was the industry minister. I mean, that cabinet note which went, I had to have his approval. Of course, he would have consulted, I got Manmohan Singh's view also, and Manmohan Singh had recommended these things earlier. Many of us had the same view. So Mr. Narasimha Rao knew that this was a technocratic view, but he put his political seal on it by sending that cabinet note. But many of the other things, you know, the opening up, uh, shifting to a flexible exchange rate, trade policy reform. These are not things that were high up on his uh, sort of way of thinking. And he left a lot of that to Manmohan Singh. So when you say architect of reform, I think an architect is someone who has a broad holistic appreciation. I think the role of the prime minister is that, look, we've got to do things differently. And in my book, I mention that in his just after he was, just before he was going to be sworn in, he called a bunch of us. I was then Commerce Secretary. And he said, what should I say in my national address? And then he said to us, please remember, you must get the cobwebs out of your mind. You must think differently. So he was aware that we are thinking, we have to think differently. But I don't think he, he would, I mean, he basically hired a good architect to design the Taj Mahal for him. I think he would be quite happy, by the way, if somebody said that he wasn't the architect of the Taj Mahal of reforms, he was the Shah Jahan of the Taj Mahal of reforms. That's not a bad way of resolving. I, 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 think, I think what you say accords with perception of most people. But would you care to reflect on the second part of my question on Dr. Manmohan Singh, his, his reform credentials as finance minister and then as prime minister. Yeah, no, you see, I think there, uh, the it is a totally different, uh, he played a very different role. I mean, as finance minister, he was actually the architect and saying, look, it's your job to manage the politics and remain prime minister. Because by definition, as long as Mr. Narasim Rao remained prime minister, the architect would be allowed to function. If Mr. Narasim Rao got dethroned, that would be the end of the architect. As prime minister, that was not his job. And I think I think he genuinely believed it was an unusual coalition. Uh, the Congress probably had, le uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the Congress had less support within the UPA 
than Narsimhrao's Congress did in that government. Manmohan Singh was not the political head of the Congress. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi was the political head of the Congress. And the number of political parties with different perspectives and political associations was much larger. His main role, I think, in the UPA was to keep the, keep the government going. And frankly, the fact that he was able to, to do that, not just in the first five years, but in the second five years, in a highly fractious kind of coalition has to be counted as a major achievement. I think his own concern was that a lot of the reforms have happened and all we have to do is to ensure a reasonable degree of macro stability and the system will do the rest. There was one major issue which I felt he thought he needed to take a lead on and that was the nuclear deal. Now, you know, uh, that's an occasion on which he, I mentioned in the book that, you know, he was quite determined. He offered to resign. He stuck to his guns and he won. I mean, there was doubt within the Congress party whether he was doing the right thing. But in the end, he was able to succeed. You know, once the nuclear deal was done, the problem was that domestically, virtually nobody viewed that as a big thing. But the truth is, a lot of what is happening now in terms of our access to technology, in terms of our defense cooperation, none of this would have been possible if the nuclear deal had not been done. So I think the benefits, he used a lot of his political uh, capability to get that key thing done, knowing that for the rest, the system is working quite well. And remember, if the economy is growing at 8%, <clears throat> and if you're uh, you're sitting back and there's a few bits of things not getting done, it's not surprising that you don't take too much interest in it. But you 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 would you had just become governor and you remember this that when the financial crisis happened, he immediately took charge himself, called a whole lot of meetings. You were there, I was there in those meetings. For the first time, you had an interministerial group trying to see how do we handle the 2008 crisis. And you, you were enormously helpful in lowering interest rates and creating the kind of easier money situation at that time. These are not things that were just left to the finance ministry to do. They were things that, you know, he set up a whole group, commerce minister was there, et cetera, a deputy chairman. I was there as deputy chairman, planning commission, and a, 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 a sort of a, Holistic approach was evolved. How do we handle the 2008 crisis? Now, there it's true that later on, uh, we, we obviously burst the fiscal deficit ceiling. The official position taken was that we're going to correct it again. And I think that was not done, which is actually, which, which was a failure. But, you know, in, in all these things, in no period do you get absolutely everything working fine. And I think that the uh, the problem with 2008 was that we managed the 2008 crisis very well, but we didn't anticipate the Eurozone crisis, which happened in 2011. And that put us into a total spin uh, and lowered the growth rate, but the growth rate didn't go down that low. And actually in 2014, it actually went up a little. So it wasn't, wasn't so bad. But the big difference, uh, the big difference really is that as prime minister, he had a much more difficult job than, let's say, Mr. Narasimha Rao did as prime minister. Mr. Narasimha Rao ran into other political problems, uh, although in economic terms, the big challenge of the crisis was over by 1993. But internal political division, the fall of the Babri Masjid, this created lots of problems for Mr. Narsim Rao. Manmohan Singh had a continuous kind of, had to deal with a continuously fractious coalition. I, and I, I don't think he could have done very much more, I su suspect. But I want to change tack once again and pick up from something that you said earlier about the role of specialists, experts in the government. You know, your career is a prime example of somebody, a specialist or an economist, who added enormous value to public policy making, and there were several others 
who made a positive contribution to public policy specialists. Now, juxtapose that with the view today that the Modi government is anti-intellectual, shuns expertise, does not welcome expert advice, does not welcome unsolicited expert advice. In fact, the refrain is that if only they had experts in the government, they would not have made all the mistakes that they've made. That's what a lot of people say. So two questions. Uh, what do you think should be the role of specialists in the government? And do you agree with the view that the Modi government uh, is anti-intellectual? <laughs> well, you know, one point I want to make is that uh, don't confuse specialists with economists. I mean, a lot of the, some of the best economists I know uh, are in the civil service. So a lot of the IS officers that I worked with were as much economists by the time they were, say, 40 years old, as many of the people I know at 40 who had done a postgraduate degree. Uh, so I think the difference, I think, is that uh, these IS officers who had specialized in economics were being put in relevant positions. And there was also a leavening of a lateral inflow of economists at the age of 40. I think one of the big mistakes that we've made uh, is that that lateral inflow stopped. And you know, the lateral inflow stopped because we, we encountered the position of economic advisor uh, within the Indian Economic Service rather than keep it open. In fact, in my view, joint secretary positions, which are normally only IAS officers, should have been made much more open. So we bring in people from outside. And similarly, for economists, you don't encounter it within the Indian Economic Service. You bring in economists laterally. Now, if you bring in economists at the age of 40, those of them that are really interested uh, in the government, and it is fascinating to be able to be in government, will sort of stay. But what we've done since then is that you can come in at the top on a fixed term position, but you don't actually grow into the system. You don't build up contacts, etc. So that's one problem. You know, the second thing is uh, listening to different viewpoints. This, I think, is a major issue. I mean, some of the best criti critics of policy, in my view, in, in my experience when I was deputy chairman, were not necessarily the economists. I mean, let's say in the world of uh, public-private partnership, uh, we just lost him. Uh, he passed away three days ago, Gajendra Haldia an IS officer from Rajasthan, who is by any standard an economist he, from the LSE, done his postgraduate work there. He's also a trained lawyer, and you know Vajendra too. There's no question that he systematically brought professional critiques out on the table on whatever policies were being followed. I think it's very important for government to have professional criticism from within on the simple principle that nobody is so good to get it right all the time. And it's very important to have people inside saying, you know, this is what's not going to work. I mean, almost everything is well-intentioned because our slogans are always excellent. The question is, what are you actually proposing? And will that actually lead to the end result? You know, the Americans in their military uh, practice have a, a system of what they call red team analysis. That, you know, whatever strategic uh, plan is developed, you have a red team identifying what's wrong with it. It's very important, by the way, the, it's not somebody who overrules and say, no, no, this is better. It's just fault finding, saying, look, this is what you say. This is going to be the problem. Now you tell me how you're going to fix that. That is, that is really what we should encourage. Because, you know, when somebody says, this is not a good strategy, this is a better strategy. I mean, your natural instinct is to find faults with a better strategy, so-called. Whereas if somebody says, okay, this is your goal. This is how you want to achieve it. This is what's wrong with that. Now tell me how you're going to improve. You get to a much more constructive uh, position. And I think we need a lot more of this. This means internal criticism, transparency. Make the internal doubts known. 
and don't rely only on, uh, if you like, uh, positive propaganda. Now, let me say positive propaganda has a very important role. Both you and I have done a lot of positive propaganda for government. But I think as long as you have within the system, the person at the top must know that this is what my positive propagandists say, but this is what the experts say could be the problem. And then you need to think about how do you take care of this? I think we need more of that. Uh, and it's not difficult in my view uh, to get that. We should, we should do it, not just by the way in the center. You know, I think we increasingly fail to realize that most of what, what ordinary people care about is really service delivery at the state level. And I don't think there's any criticism being done at the state level in any state, whatever the political parties in power. So I think we need we need to do that much more. When you say we need to do much more, uh, you say it needed to be done much more across governments, not necessarily just government. I think, well, I have a feeling that we did a fair amount of it during the UPA. I mean, let's put it this way. If you look at the if you look at the criticisms of the public private, I mean, I was myself a great advocate of public private partnership for the simple reason that if the government doesn't have the money and the private sector fellows say that we can help, let's bring them in. But then I had Gajinder Haldir telling me all the ways in which the private sector might uh, fiddle the thing or do it wrongly, and we gave a lot of publicity to, to that. So. Uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to criticize the UPA's PPP program, you could get a lot of material from the Planning Commission demonstrating uh, the problems. Uh, and I think we need, you know, we need that much more. Okay. Okay. Now let me ask you about the Planning Commission. You were Deputy Chairman for ten years. You were a member of the Planning Commission for a couple of years before that, and as Finance Secretary over an extended period who dealt with the Planning Commission. In fact, you have an entire chapter in your book devoted to giving an insider view of Planning Commission. On the other hand, one of the first things that the Modi government did was to disband the Planning Commission and replace that with Niti Aayog. Mm -hmm. Now, was something of value lost in that transition? You're an accomplished debater. <laughs> the topic for debate is this house believes that the planning commission should be revived. What arguments will you make in about two minutes? You know, that's that's something you should ask someone like Shashi Tharoor to do because he's very good at it. And the essence of a debate is that you've got to make a smart remark, you've got to be entertaining. So I'll address the question you raised. You know, I think that uh I was asked, uh, what are you thinking of restructuring? You know, what is your view, etc. And actually, Manmohan Singh himself, towards the end of the UPA, had asked us to reflect. And I think that my feeling was that, uh, A, you need to separate out the purely analytical contribution from the executive function. Uh, and technically, the Planning Commission has no executive role because the allocation decision technically is a finance ministry decision. The planning commission only advises the prime minister and the finance minister what that should be. And between the two of them, they agree on something, but a lot of the homework on that was done in the planning commission, not in the finance ministry. My feeling is that if you are trying to make an allocation decision across different ministries, it cannot be left to the finance ministry because the finance ministry's job should be macroeconomic. Uh, the, that doesn't mean you need a planning commission. Maybe you should have an office of management of development budget in the prime minister's office. So, you know, whether you call it planning, planning is a very old fashioned word. I mean, frankly, I think I mentioned in my book yeah. that when I left, the planning commission because i was given this job uh, to be the first director of the independent evaluation office i called on mr Vajpai to say that i'm leaving and thanked him for you know having put me in the planning commission and i said you know sir i have one piece of advice this this planning planning has become a very old-fashioned word i mean corporations do planning 
But somehow when government says planning, it invokes the image of the Soviet Union, Goss plan and this kind of stuff. And I said, even the Chinese have renamed their commission, the Commission for Economic Restructuring and Reform. They don't call it planning commission. It's called And you know, Mr. Vajpayee thought about this and he said, Are bhai, jo bhi aap logo ne karna hai, aap kariye. Naam badal denge to left aise hi naraz ho jayegi. So, you know, later on, uh, uh, when I was uh, in New York, I met Rudy Dornbush. And Rudy said, I said to him, Rudy, lots of things are happening in India and you've never visited. And Rudy said, look, there's no reform taking place in India. Uh, so what's the point of going there? I said, no, no, you're quite wrong. You know, ever since 1991, we've done lots of things, etc." And he said, what do you mean you've done a lot of things? You've still got a planning commission, haven't you? So I said, yeah, yeah, we've got a planning commission. But, you know, I'd mentioned to the prime minister that we should change the name. But he said, what's the point of changing the name? I mean, it'll just annoy the left. To which Rudy Dornbush said, you know, if you're still afraid of the left, you're not doing any reforms. So that was that was the, that time, the view, this was 2001, uh, you know, a bit of triumphalism uh, in the West about uh, the rise of market economy and so forth. But I do think that uh, you have to ask that question. Who is making the allocation decision. And I personally do not think that you you reduce the value of the finance ministry as a macroeconomic monitor by making and do allocation decisions. So you need something. If you don't want to do it in Niti Aayog, you do it in the prime minister's office. Secondly, I don't think you need this for every ministry. I mean, I think the planning commission working out every little bit, frankly, we, we should have been looking at maybe the big allocation decisions between six or seven different things. And the small things can be done in a routine type of way. The third thing, and this is very crucial, is that when you spend on money, I mean, how do you make sure that the projects are well conceived? I don't think, by the way, that we did a good job on that. Because, you know, we were locked into these usual rates of return calculations, etc., etc. I think we should have much more the kind of uh, red team analysis that this is what these guys are proposing and this is why it's not going to work and how do we address that. And I I feel, we we're, again, it doesn't matter whether you do it in Niti Aayog or you do it in the Prime Minister's office, it can't be done in the Finance Ministry. If you do it in the Finance Ministry, you'll be creating a different department <clears throat> which would just be moving that function right. to the finance, finance ministry. But I think the prime minister needs two different uh, Point of view. Uh, uh, points of view. Yeah, yeah. The development guys who say we need more money to get growth and the other guys who say, well, look, that's just not right because, you know, you're not actually getting growth by spending all this money. If you combine everything in one ministry, that will not surface at the level of the PM. So the sum and substance of what you're saying is that something of value was lost in the transition from planning commission to media. If this is not being done, I don't know what's being done, but if it's not being done, then I think it was lost. I can remember many occasions discussing with the prime minister, first of all, how big a size of plan do we need? And secondly, what are the real priorities? Right. Uh, and I think to have that discussion at the PM's level uh, for the major programs is very important. And when you do it, when, when you have the planning commission uh, or somebody, they're also very aware that if you spend this much money here, you will get less somewhere else. Today, what is happening is that everybody is announcing huge programs for the next five years. And you can announce whatever program you like and you say the private sector will contribute this, the states will contribute that, and we're only going to contribute this much. But nobody's adding up these sums. I mean, do the states have that money? Can the private sector do that much? And I think we need that, frankly. Yeah. Actually, that triggers another question in my mind. You know, you talk about a very interesting incident in your book when you accompanied Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi to London under the reception for him and there was a huge crowd there. You introduced Dr. Ajit Patel to the Prime Minister. 
And Dr. Ajit Patel had just two minutes with the PM, but he used that very efficiently to give very concrete and specific advice to Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Now, if you had two minutes with Prime Minister Modi, what would you tell him? What <laughs> I'm not, not as clever as Ajit Patel, who really... Uh, uh, no, but you know, I would say much the kind of thing. I, I would say two or three things, actually. Um, first, it's very, if you, if you make a list of reforms, the list is huge. Uh, because after all, everything is important, everything needs to be reformed. So that's not very interesting. I think you have limited political mileage at any given time. And there are some things which are going to raise huge objections like the farm law seem to have done. So it's very important to concentrate your energies on three or four big things. And those are the things that should have political uh, leverage or momentum. Like right now, I would say two things are important. One, let's please fix the GST. Everybody loves it. You've got the credit for it, for bringing it in, and everybody agrees it's being mucked up. This is not beyond the capacity of real experts. And I would say on this, please do not rely on the revenue department because they're the ones who've built it so far. I mean, they've done a wonderful job given their constraints. But like if, if you were a sec finance secretary, I mean, revenue secretary all of a sudden, and you, want, you, were, you, you said you came to the conclusion, this thing isn't working. There's not much point telling the people who have been functioning on it, by all means bring some of them in, but get some world experts to tell you what would an ideal GST look like. The prime minister has huge political popularity. You've got a bunch of B G BJP states that are in power and it's the GST that has to decide. So probably if you can come to the conclusion that this is what we're going to do, I think you have the political capital to get it done. Nothing would be more important than people saying, wow, India has finally got the GST right. So that's point number one. Point number two, I would say, is the banking system. I mean, there is no chance on earth of us going back to high growth. By the way, we are going to get high growth next year. I mean, you know, uh, we dropped 7.7% this year. So if you go back to 2019-20 GDP next year, uh, we'll get an 8% growth. Actually, in the first quarter, we may get a 20% growth because last year we had a 24% decline. Do, do, not, do not be fooled into focusing on the next year. The next year is a recovery year. The real question you have to ask yourself is that, look, you entered the pandemic with a growth rate of 4.2% before the pandemic hit. When the pandemic is, we've got back to normal, which will be done during the next year, are we going back to 4.2? I mean, that would be an unmitigated disaster. Now, if you're going to grow at 4.2, is going to go up to 6%, 7%, something like that. I mean, it's not going to happen unless the banks are ticking and ready to go, and they're not. Now, uh, I've just written something which hopefully will come out in Mint tomorrow. So I won't go on or just look yeah. at it. If, if they decide to publish it, they say they are. But I think that there are five or six things which are pending. And they're not things I've invented. They're things that you are familiar with. You have even pushed some of them in the past. They're on the agenda. They're in the pipeline. And if you were to make an assessment based on technical expertise, the majority of the technical fellows would say, this is a good thing to do. So I said six is a big number. So just get four of them done. That would be a huge change. Okay. I won't list them, but look at the article in Mint. So, you know, two, and by the way, my other, my other thing, if I got two minutes would be, I think that the reversal of the trend of reducing customs duty is a very unfortunate mistake. We did very well with the trajectory of reduction. The Vajpayee government continued that very strongly. We need to integrate with the rest of East Asia. And if people are afraid of China, 
you know my view is that by whatever means if you if you started to discuss with china that something's unfair and you became obdurate and all the rest of it nobody would blame you but for god's sake let's not cut out the whole of our set just because china is in it and look at it from our set's point of view china is going to be the largest economy in the world in a few years so obviously they want china in that's the world we are in we should join it not walk out so your three point formula is fix the gst implement banking reforms and reverse import tariffs or don't don't raise them any further right that would be my view yeah now i i think i'm running out of my time but the one question that i want to ask you at a very personal level you know your entire career has been on piloting reforms on negotiating reforms through democratic politics as we spoke before was there at any time a moment of despair a moment of self doubt for something inspiring you know despair definitely not because i'm a sort of a uh, congenitally optimistic guy and you know i think my generation which is also your generation i mean we looking back we all saw that change is taking place and we all saw that the country is doing better and better i mean in the entire period from 1980 right through to 2014 there were many many occasions when you would feel that things are getting mucked up something is held up something is not happening but if you asked yourself in the previous 3 years has the country done better you would say yeah it has done better so it was possible to convince oneself that india is a country with great potential uh, and yeah sure there are problems here and there but we'll come the mind you the indian cricket team's performance in australia yesterday would suggest that you know if that's a reflection of what india can do that potential is still there so i'm not necessarily uh, i don't think there's any reason for despair self doubt of course because you know in the end uh, you think something is going to work but to be honest if you i mean unless you're a completely pig headed person you would say well, i'm not really sure uh, but let's try and uh, if it doesn't work we'll change our mind that's why i felt that your characterization of baby steps to where i was quite a good one because i don't think that a, a central banker that jumps off the deep end he certainly wouldn't be called baby step but uh, i'm not sure that you feel more comfortable but the important thing is that you know gradualism must be combined with clear direction gradualism is not sitting on the beach and just fiddling with the stones it's it's a sort of let's move forward but you know at what pace in what direction this is something you're making up your mind so despair no but self doubt yes Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, self doubt always. You just hope for the. I mean, look, you've got to be lucky. That's a characteristic of level-headedness, as you say. And this yeah. is the last question I'm going to ask you. You know, this this event is on Zoom, theoretically accessible to virtually everybody on the planet, but it's being anchored by a wonderful platform we have in Hyderabad, Manco, with a formidable reputation for very high-quality discussion. We all, as Hyderabad, is very proud. As Hyderabad, we are also proud of your association with our city. You grew up here in your middle school years. What's your most nostalgic recall of this wonderful city? Well, actually, no. I I have. Uh, when you say Hyderabad, I mean Hyderabad was the place that my father took me to over the weekend every now and then to see the big sites. My uh, My This, recollection is about Secunderabad. So, if you want to own Secunderabad as a subsidiary of Hyderabad, uh, I had a wonderful time. And you know, I my dominant recollection as a kid uh, was that um, it had none of the kind of uh, crowding and all the rest of it, which is now so common, even in Hyderabad and Secunderabad. Oh, yes. That that just reflects uh, 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 the state of development. you know i used to live used to live in a in a in a in a a line in a in a military uh, area because my father was in the defense accounts so although he was a civilian he got accommodated there 
I was right next to a village called Karkhana, which still exists. And you know, it was a wonderful example actually of coexistence between a Muslim half of the village and a Hindu half of the village. And as a 10 year old, uh, I would be wandering around this place with no sense uh, of any insecurities or anything like that. I think given, given what is now talked about of polarization and so forth, I do feel that uh, that was quite an experience uh, to see. Yeah. And the other, the other thing is that, you know, um, I mentioned, I think I mentioned this in the book, that um, in, in the school I went to was St. Patrick's High School in Sikandabad. You know, it was not an elite school. It was an English medium school, but it was not an elite school at all. Uh, and it was, um, it brought in a lot of people uh, from middle and lower middle classes also. And I, I remember uh, in on one occasion that my parents had organized a birthday party for me and I invited my school friends. And of course, they were all school friends for little, little presents. And one of the boys gave me an envelope. So I kind of thought there must be some money in it, you know, so I can buy my own present. And it was interesting that it contained a note saying, Dear Monte, I want to wish you a very happy birthday. My parents cannot afford to let me get you a present, but I wish you a happy birthday. You know, I don't remember any present I've ever received as a kid, but I remember that letter a great affection. And it made me realize that, you know, I was not that disconnected with the economic reality of the country. We weren't moving around in elite uh, circles. Sometimes I think that, you know, uh, there's, there's not enough of that, given what has happened to education. Uh, and certainly um, people need to go to schools which give them an experience of different economic strata. Uh, and I think that's, that's not happening today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that feel good response. And I think that's a nice point to end this conversation. And thank you very much. Uh, that's all I want to say. I think I've taken more time than the organizers have allowed me, but I want to revert to them now. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, Subha. Th thank you, both of you. This was one of the most fascinating and enlightening conversations we have had at Manthan, despite the fact that we are proud of great conversations we host, but this was absolutely top rate. Uh, uh, I and all of us audience, I mean, if you see the feedback on YouTube, the audience feedback has been extremely overwhelming. Thank you so very much, Dr. Aluwalia. You were incisive, insightful, and so articulate. And Dr. Subarao, you lifted the entire conversation to a level which uh, uh, brought the best out of uh, uh, Dr. Alualia's uh, uh, thought process. Thank you so very much. Um, I don't think we should really ask you any more questions from the audience. Uh, the, uh, conversation has covered everything that needs to be covered. It was really good. Uh, Vikram, would you want to ask something before we have maybe two, three questions and then close this? Yeah, Ajay, can you switch on my video? You have just stopped it. Yeah. There, uh, I, I can only echo what uh, Ajay has said. Uh, it's been a very fascinating insight into the world of reform. And both of you have really contributed to our thinking and learning. Uh, so I don't want to ask too many questions, but I would just want to ask one or two questions uh, from all from the audience. Uh, the question is to Monte. Uh, was the Kerala model of decentralization, governance, focus on education and health ever part of a discussion while framing economic policies? Oh, yes, very much so, actually. Um... You know, Amartya Sen was the one who most sensitized us to the, the need to look at human development side and education. So, uh, as a matter of fact, we were very well aware that although Kerala at that time didn't seem to have a very high growth rate, it was in some ways, uh, it was in some ways uh, 
moving ahead in human development much more effectively uh, than other states were doing. But you know, what happened is that after a while, I mean, Kerala's growth rate also picked up. Now, of course, part of the problem is that whether that was due to human development or due to the fact that um, it had a big benefit from migration and remittances, this is something that uh, really needed to be studied much more. Uh, but we were very aware uh, that Kerala has this. And mind you, the role of education in Kerala is not something that is very recent. I mean, for a variety of reasons, I mean, Kerala, even during its uh, pre-British times uh, or pre-independence times, had kind of uh, greater emphasis on expanding education, etc. So it, it seemed to be closer to what uh, Sri Lanka was doing. And we were aware that that is an alternative, no doubt about it. But the only thing was that Kerala had one huge advantage. And that is the comparative advantage of migrating to the Middle East, which made it possible not to do too much in terms of domestic industry, but get all the income flow you need to support a reasonable level of prosperity and consumption by having migrants go across to the Gulf. So, I mean, if you would followed exactly the same model in a state which didn't have this access to migration, whether it will have led to the same results is a different question. But, you know, underneath what you're saying is uh, what I've always felt, that uh, we, we haven't worked out sufficiently the differential strategies that different states would follow. Uh, I mean, clearly, for example, in Punjab's case, the strategy was clearly green revolution and so on has become a big problem right now because they got stuck into a form of agriculture which is actually causing ecological damage. But, you know, we, we didn't have enough of this studying different states to see what is working and what is not working. I have uh, one question, Dr. Aluwalia. Uh, the 1991 reforms uh, became a big hit, but uh, were they backed by an intellectual environment at that time which supported it within the government and outside the government? And is the absence of that a reason now we don't see a major movement on reforms uh, in the present uh, last few years or so? Well, uh, two or three things. I mean, first remember that the 91 reform, we were a real outlier. I mean, in the sense that if you looked at what was happening around the rest of the world, we were following a model which was so extreme in terms of the degree of government control that it, many people were aware that India was very different. Now, you know, China is also very different in many ways, but China is growing very rapidly. So if you're very different and you're not doing well, naturally people begin to wonder, well, could it be that we're getting it wrong? So I think there was an intellectual question. But I wouldn't say that the, there was a universal belief that we needed more liberalization. I mean, many people felt that, look, the problem is that our governmental system is not efficient. The public sector should be, there's no reason why the public sector shouldn't be efficient. It isn't efficient, but let's give it the environment which will make it efficient. So there was, there was a lot of that. I think, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, plus the rise of China experimenting with greater international integration made a big difference. Because the Soviet Union never tried to do any international integration with a closed economy, uh, working its own way, and that collapsed in 1991, although it was very clear by 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, that this was kind of on its way out. On the other hand, you had the example of East Asia doing extremely well, and Originally, the feeling was that East Asia is doing well because they are American stooges and so on. But when China started to do very well, and it was by no means an American stooge, I think people began to sense that, you know, if you integrate with a global economy and take advantage of world trade, you can do very well. And I think that there was a lot of that that was happening. The third thing I think was happening was that you began to have a middle class 
which question some of the essential presumptions of the old strategy. And two presumptions were critical. One, the presumption that you don't enforce, you don't emphasize consumer goods. I mean, the essence of the middle class is that they do well and they want to have more consumer goods. And even Rajiv Gandhi in his time had realized that we can't continue with a system which said that we're not going to encourage consumption. Uh, plus, you have this feeling that all over the world, even the Chinese, were giving much more emphasis to private initiative of various kinds, highly supported by the state, but still private initiative. So that undermined the notion that the public sector uh, must have a commanding heights of the economy. So these were intellectual influences that were very much at work. Uh, and I think they made it easier uh, to push ahead. I would say that, you know, the situation today is not totally comparable simply because it's a much more complex situation. I mean, in those days, we just had to get rid of a lot of very, very silly regulations. Today, we've got to build new institutions. I mean, for example, around the world, people are beginning to think that if you simply promote markets, then in a world of technology and high tech and digital economy and, you know, the, the fact that the, uh, the first mover advantage creates monopolies automatically, you need to regulate these big tech giants. And this is a problem that the Americans and the Europeans are also facing. So what is the quality of regulation that you need to make an efficient market outcome? This is a very major issue. And it's not the kind of problem we had in 1991, where you just had get rid of this regulation, everything will be all right. Creating an institution Correct. is a 10, 20 year program. And I think we are now in an environment where a number of institutions have to be strengthened and there has to be trust in those institutions and how they function. Uh, and that takes a long time uh, to develop. So it's a much, much more complex, uh, complex thing. This is uh, a hot topic of today. There's a question on the agricultural reforms and the current farm laws. Uh, the, que the question is, why should uh, actually, it's a good question. Why should MSP be given to agriculture at all? After all, there is no MSP to industry. Uh, <laughs> so why can't we totally privatize it? But having said that, uh, the, uh, it says uh, the question is that, is it, why did you ignore agricultural reforms for 30 years? And, uh, uh, well, no, that's a good, uh, good question. Let me say, I don't think we ignored agricultural reforms. You know, the opening up of trade and the movement to a competitive exchange rate was a major pro-agriculture move. Because earlier what was happening was that we were running an overvalued exchange rate, which actually meant that uh, foreign goods, foreign agricultural imports were very cheap uh, because the exchange rate was being overvalued. The industry was benefiting from huge protection. But for them, the exchange rate was not overvalued. Uh, but exporters lost because they had an overvalued exchange rate. And agriculture also lost because imports of agriculture looked uh, easy. So we wouldn't allow that either to take place. And as a result, I mean, agriculture was isolated from market influence. Now, I mean, I would say that if you look at the uh, post-91 period, uh, gradually the growth rate of agriculture began to improve. Uh, a lot of, I mean, I, I, I agree that we were not able to get rid of dysfunctional subsidies. We tried a lot to get a lot of investment going, especially rural roads, etc. You know, the current view is where we have failed, I think, uh, and this is the UP has failed as much as the present NDA has failed. We're not putting enough money into agricultural research. There's a lot of work that's been done, particularly with climate change coming along. The amount of resources that must be divert, uh, devoted to agricultural research that would improve <clears throat> the ability of agriculture to be productive in a world of climate change. We need big increases. The Chinese are doing that. We are not. 
we much prefer to give subsidies. <clears throat> now, you mentioned earlier that people are saying, why should we have an MSP? Because industry doesn't. The problem is, it's because these questions are being asked that the farm laws are being misunderstood. All the farmers probably think that you're going to withdraw the MSP straight away because there are people saying, why do you have them? You know, this is, I think we need a, we need a very, we need a well articulated agricultural reform strategy in which it is clearly indicated what are the many different things that we're going to do that will support agriculture and what are the things that we are going to do that will allow better markets and to what extent will traditional forms of support like MSP be suddenly taken away <clears throat> or will it gradually adjust to a different arrangement? I think we need a holistic picture. And the, the problem with the farm laws is that they, they lend themselves to people fearing that you're going to get rid of Mondays, you're going to get rid of MSP. Not to be fair, the government has said that we're not going to get rid of MSP. But you know, when they hear a lot of people saying, why do we have MSPs? It creates, it, you need to do more <clears throat> to persuade farmers. What is our five-year plan for agriculture? And I don't think we have that yet. It's so true. true. Uh, let's uh, close this gentleman here. This has been, once again, I repeat, it has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, uh, just with good news that uh, Mr. Trump has left Washington right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I got a message from uh, Mrs. Usha Thorat that this was a very exciting, very fascinating conversation that we had. So I thought I'll pass on those compliments to you. Thank, well, thank you very much. Glad to hear that Usha was watching. Hello, Usha ji. Thank you for your, <laughs> for your comments.